So earlier I said when your alpha uh, is smaller, right, meaning that you're using wider control distance. Um, here this is 1.96. Oops, I'm sorry. Here this is 1.96 sigma. Here it's a 3 sigma, right? So the alpha here is 0 0.05. The alpha here is 0027. Alpha. Okay, so of course when alpha is smaller, you stop less often. Okay, but at what cost? Right? If you think about that, when you stop less often, that means you're accepting more often. Again, when you start to reject less often, that means you're accepting more often. Okay, so the reflection number five is that under a wider control, it is easier to make a beta error. Okay, so what is a beta error? This is a, this is also called type two error. You are accepting a false null hypothesis, right? Uh, alpha or the type one error only occurs when you reject something. Okay, when you reject something, meaning when you stop a line, when you stop a line doing inspection, and turns out that the process mean did not change. That is your type one error or the case of alpha. You rejected, right? You stopped the line. That means you rejected your null hypothesis at this at that point. And then you continue to do the inspection. It turns out that process mean did not change. Okay? But if you think about the beta, you did not stop the line. You're assuming that your process mean is intact. However, if you do not stop in a line because you believe that process mean has not changed, and you possibly are making the type two error, okay? Which is the which is the case of beta. So um, let me give you a more detailed illustration on the alpha and beta under the control limit situation. So if you look at this red area, this is the case of alpha. Right, anything that go above this particular, let me just say this is a control limit. If anything go above, go more than control limit, your action is that you will be stopping it because you believe it is too big. Okay, so when you stop a line, you're possibly making a uh, type 1 error. Okay, but if you look at the flip side, what happens? When an outcome is smaller than the control limit, you do not stop a line, meaning that you are accepting the fact that the null hypothesis is a certain parameter. If you are not stopping the line, okay, that is the case of beta. You are not stopping the line even though you are looking at a something from a totally different distribution. So here are uh, two distribution here, okay? So this will be from the good process, right? This is a good process. There are signs of alpha in the good process, okay? And this is a case of bad process, okay? This is a case of bad process. So. You see, bad process, because standard deviation is the same, although the mean has shifted, standard deviation is the same, okay? So the outcome from this bad process can still span from this area all the way to this area. Sometimes, it will give you some pretty plausible outcome that makes you believe that, right? Makes you believe that the process has not changed. Look at this green area. It actually fell within the control limit. So even though the green area is actually generated by the bad process, because it fell within the control limit, therefore you're not stopping the line. Okay, this makes a uh, beta 2 error. So now you're under dilemma. Your, your, your control limit cannot be too narrow because that makes you stop the line more frequently. But you cannot have too wide of a control limit because it is susceptible for the type two error. And what is your solution? 
right? And then the only thing we can consider doing is to change the sample size. A larger sample size has a higher chance of detecting the process mean shift. Okay, when you use a bigger sample size, it is much helpful in helping you detect the process mean at the first place, therefore controlling the case of beta. Okay, so this is a somewhat sophisticated. Therefore, um, I made a Excel applet so that I can show you in a more dynamic sense. Okay, uh, let me switch back to Excel at this point. Of course, this Excel file is attached, so you can you can download it and play around by yourself. So <laughs> here is the Excel applet that I have mentioned. Um, let's um, let me remove all these things. Um, so as you can see from here, let me just A, B, D. That's not A, B, D, what I'm doing. <laughs> T, B, D. Okay, I'm sorry. T, B, D. So the blue one here is actually the population uh, distribution, right? This population distribution of X1 the process X1 has the average of 30, the average of 30 right here, right? Uh, if you look at here, 30, and a standard deviation of 5, right? And then I constructed a sampling distribution of X1, which is using the sample size of 25, okay? This, therefore, this sampling distribution of X1 follows this shape. Uh, it's again, it's a normal distribution, however, it has the standard deviation of 1 as opposed to the standard deviation of 5 in the population distribution. Okay, so if you if you don't know how to calculate the standard deviation for the sampling distribution, it is basically uh, 5 over square root of 25. Okay, therefore we got 1 here. And then I'm using control distance of 3, so this red pillar here is the control distance. Okay, and naturally, our uh, lower control limit here is 27, upper control limit is 33. We have just a little bit outside the lower and upper control limit. Okay, so I hope this makes sense to you. And, and then let's consider the shift. Okay, let's consider the shift. Let's say the, the process has shifted by the size of standard deviation, which is 35 here. Okay, so as you can see that this is a gray uh, standard deviation, I'm sorry, the gray distribution here represents the process after shift. Okay, of course, we don't like to see shift, but my point here is I'm trying to detect this shift using the control chart. Okay, so as you can see that, 35 here is down below. Here is our average. And if you construct a sampling distribution, meaning if you draw a sample out of this new 35, uh, new 35 averaged distribution, that your sampling distribution will look like this. Okay, so. Let's take a look at the alpha and beta. Okay, so I think under the current case, it is not very difficult to detect the shift because you only stop when you spot something that outside of your original control limit. Again, the control limit is not changed because you are not aware of the shift. Okay, you are still using original control chart control limits to detect the shift. As you can see, anything above the Upper control limit, here this guy. Let me see. And maybe use green color, right? So this is our upper control limit. So when process has shifted, when you draw a sample, you'll be the, the sample outcome will be following this yellow distribution okay but your control limit is still here so you'll be stopping a line for this proportion 
Okay, you will not be stopping line for this proportion. Okay, therefore the area is huge, so that when you see a when you see a huge shift like this case, it actually shifted five unit, right? This shifted five unit, and it will not be very difficult using the original control chart to detect the shift. Okay, let's consider other cases where the shift is really small. 31, and I'm also changing this to 31. Okay, let me see if I can erase all the drawings here. Can you, um, can you take a look at yourself? Whether it's easy or difficult to detect a shift. Okay. Uh, when the shift is only one, right? When the shift here is only one here, here to here. These two <laughs> spans should be the same uh, from 30 to 31, okay? Maybe here is narrower. So when the shift is only like one unit, um, the area outside of the control limit for this new yellow distribution is not as big as the previous case. In other words, when your shift is much smaller, um, maybe it is not very easy to detect a shift. Okay, but the potential uh, fix is we can increase the sample size to see the changes in this particular area that is outside of the control limit. Okay, um, the shift is still one unit, but this time I'm changing the sample size for maybe 64, okay? Sample size is 64. So with a change in sample size, the area outside seems to increase a lot, okay? Seems to increase a lot. Um, it may not be immediately visible here. I mean, you, you can do the calculation if you want. Uh, using the distribution formula in Excel. Um, but one thing you may not have noticed is that as I use 64 as the sample size, right? The control limit reduced, right? If you haven't noticed, let me demonstrate it one more time. When you are using 25 as a sample size, the control limit it's between 27 to 33, okay? But when you are increasing it to 64, your control limit is from 28.125 to 31.875. Your control limit is actually narrowed down a lot. When your control limit is narrowed, and it will be easier for you to detect the change um, just by looking at this area, right? It has actually increased from this case. This case. Okay, so that is the, the insight. If you try to control both alpha and the beta, and the sample size is actually your only choice. So when you're trying to control your alpha and the beta to a certain level, and sample size is the um, only meaningful weapon uh, to control the both type of error. Uh, to how to do that specifically mathematically, um, I will leave that for you to in the graduate course. Okay, but uh, fundamental uh, the the bottom line here is that you need to be able to tell the alpha and the beta and the implication of the sample size in controlling both type of the um, uh, both type of errors, okay? So at least you need to tell um, when the process have shifted, which area you need to see in order to tell the frequency of the line stoppage, which is this area right here. So if we're using the previous example, the average error, average was 31 after the shift, and standard error was st uh, still one because standard deviation is not changed. The sample size was 25, right? This is previous case. So the um, probability 
of being able to detect a line shift is here. So for that, you can use, I'm sorry, you can use norm dist. Okay, upper control limit was 30, 33, if I'm not wrong. Right. So 33 was established based on assumption that your process has not shifted. And your new average is 31. Okay, your standard error is one. And we do we still do true. Well, I think you, you need to one minus that to be able to calculate area here. So this is the probability of detecting the shift under this context. I hope this makes sense to you. Um, there's nothing dif difficult here uh, other than you need to tell which distribution you need to use to calculate the probability. Okay, so this help you find out the probability of detecting the uh, process mean shift. So go back to the previous slides and study again if you did not fully understand it. Okay, so it's that that important. If you look at this operating characteristics curve, um, if you do not understand what I've discussed so far, there's no way for you to understand this 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 curve. Okay, so assuming that, let's pick this particular line here. Assuming that your mean shifted. 1.5 standard deviation distance. Your mean has shifted by 1.5 standard deviation distance. Okay? And then when your sample size is 2, there's only like 20% chance you can detect the mean shift. Okay? But when you use sample size number 3, there's around 35% chance you can detect the line shift. When you are using sample size 8, there's nearly 90% chance you can detect the mean shift. When you are using sample size 10, uh, 10 or I mean 15 or more, um, there's 100% chance you can detect the mean shift. Okay, the probability here is that the larger the better, right? The larger the better, the larger the easier for you to be able to detect the shifting mean. So I, th I hope this whole uh, curve makes sense to you. And the practical concerns, you can just go over this by yourself. Um, but for the convenience, let me read it. If the cost of investigating an operation to identify the cause of an, an apparent out of control condition is high, wider control limits should be adopted, right? So that your system is less sensitive. Conversely, if the cost is low, narrower limits should be selected. If the cost of defective output generated by an operation is substantial, Narrower control limits should be used. Otherwise, wider limits should be selected. If the cost, both types of error are significant, wide control limits should be chosen and a larger sample size should be used. Also, more frequent sample should be taken to reduce the duration of any out of control conditions that might occur. You see, the cost of both type of errors are significant. Wide control limit should be chosen, and a larger sample size should be used. I hope that makes sense to you at this point, right? If past experience with an operation indicates that an out-of-control condition arises quite frequently, narrower control limits should be considered. In the event that the probability of an out-of-control condition is small, wider limits might be preferred. So I think that kind of concludes the chapter eight. Um, I hope you have a thorough understanding of what we have learned from the chapter 8. It is actually a very, very smart technique that can help you uh, to detect some of the problems that's arising from your manufacturing or service or processes. Okay, uh, good luck and, and this all these six different reflections should be able to help you figure out the second last questions in the homework number five. Okay, thank you.